Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. And I'm Tracy McRae. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 30 million Americans have diabetes. That's more than 9% of the U.S. population. Diabetes means there is too much sugar or glucose in the blood, which can lead to serious health problems, such as increased risk of cardiovascular disease, nerve and kidney damage, and problems with the eyes and feet. Along with the health problems comes the cost. On average, a person diagnosed with diabetes spends almost $8,000 a year on health care costs related to their disease. November is Diabetes Awareness Month. Here to discuss is Mayo Clinic endocrinologist and diabetes expert, and I would say our favorite endocrinologist and diabetes expert, Dr. Robert Rizza. Welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. (laughs) So it uh, definitely deserves its own month, doesn't it, diabetes awareness? Well, it it does. I mean, the primary reason is that, as you were saying, the, the unfortunately, it's a very, very common disease, and as you're alluding to, the cost, but even more, the cost in human suffering. And the reason diabetes awareness is so important, it doesn't have to happen. I mean, because diabetes is a classic disease. You take care of it, you do not have problems, or, or you do, but very rarely. And you don't take care of it, awful things happen. So by being aware, by knowing what you need to do, you can take care of yourself and your loved ones. So what are the class, classifications of diabetes, the different types? Well, that's right, different types, which refer to as type 1 and type 2. And whenever medical professionals refer to things as type, that usually means they don't know what they're talking about. Hold on. There was just a type 3 I heard about. What's that? Well, there's a type 3, type 1 and type 2. And okay. what they are is type 1 and type 2. So type 1 is a, a disease in which the, your autoimmune system destroys the insulin-secreting cells in your pancreas. They're called beta cells. So that's an immune system. Type 2 is a disease in which a variety of factors, combination of environment and genes, conspire so that you're no longer able to secrete enough insulin. And the operative word is enough. Now, you may be secreting a bunch more insulin than a non-diabetic person, but you may be heavy, you may be sedentary, your body needs more. But for some reason, your pancreas can't compensate. Now, people are alluded to type 3, which you're saying is that turns 21st out... 21st century thing? Well, it's not a 21st century, <laughs> but it's a very old disease. Is what, what's happened is that it's very evident that people who, you know, say you're in your 50s or 60s, you're overweight, you develop what you would think would be typically type 2, but a subset of those people actually have antibodies to these beta cells. That's called a latent. Latent one said diabetes, the adult. You make up all this stuff. So some people thought they should call it type 3 because there are clearly these, these, these crosses. Now, type 2, which is referred to, again, as the people who – the trash, classical thing is this older group, although, you know, you can get this when you're younger, unfortunately, if you're very overweight, that these people commonly – you know, will have this genetic preposition, but as long as they remain lean and fit or don't gain weight, they don't get to this disease. That's why it's so complicated when you talk about different types. There are some really, truly, you know, so-called genetic one gene, but these are very, very rare. This, these are the kind of things off to the side, but the common ones are so-called type 1 immune, type 2. And type 1 used to be called juvenile onset diabetes, but 30% of the people who have type 1 diabetes are over the age of 30. So if you got Type 1 when you're 90, and they call it juvenile, and said that was pretty silly. That was why it was changed, the type 1 type and type 2. So, Dr. Rizzo, I thought that uh, blood sugars were a good thing. For example, if you're an athlete, we're told to eat carbohydrates, get blood sugars, but clearly that's not the so case. So, Sanj, I don't know who tells you to eat carbohydrates. <laughs> you're an athlete. What you need when you're an athlete is eat calories. And so when you're an athlete, yes. what you're doing is, is your muscle is burning glucose, stored glucose, which is called glycogen. You deplete that very rapidly, particularly if you're any kind of a distance or, or, or prolonged. Then you start burning free fatty acids. But the key crux, I keep saying the word burning. You know, so as long as you're burning the calories, that's not a problem. Okay. So if you happen to be a, a lumberjack and you're burning 7,000 calories a day, you can eat all the fat, all the carbohydrate you want. But most of us are not burning that many calories, and so therefore we don't. We're eating more uh-huh. calories than we're burning. See, the problem is he's a soccer player and he's gotten hit in the head too many times. <laughs> I think that might be the problem. <laughs> what is pre? Is that the problem, Doctor Kaiker? No. No. Okay. <laughs> what is pre-diabetes? Well, well, pre-di- That's also a kind of a 21st century thing, isn't it? What well, is? So this came back came about in 1997. You know, when, when the group of people around the world got together and said, well, what's the definition of diabetes? I mean, when, when do you have diabetes? You know, and so the definition of diabetes is that when your fasting blood sugar is over 126 milligrams per DL or your hemoglobin A1C, this is a different kind of test, you know, is, is over 6.5% or your 2-hour glucose tolerance test is over 200. 
Now, you don't have to remember these numbers. Of course, obviously, you won't. And the reason those numbers were chosen is that there were large numbers of photographs taken of people in wet sugars around the world, Cairo, United States, you know, different parts. And it's around that number when you're first beginning seeing microscopic changes mm -hmm. in the eyes. So that was said, okay, 126 is, is diabetes. It's like a blood pressure 140. Why is, your hy why is it hypertension when it's 140? Well, because if you're over 140, you begin to have more strokes. So over 126, you begin to have these things. Prediabetes was 100 to 125 because it was clear that even though you didn't have these retinal findings, you already were not secreting enough insulin. So you were on your way unless something was done. So the definition of diabetes was already there was some evidence of damage. Prediabetes, if, and if you, if you treat it, of course, that stops. Prediabetes was if you didn't do something, you were going to move down that line. It's the warning light. Right. It's a predisposition. It's not a warning. I mean, it'd be, right, we, well, different words. Predisposition yeah. doesn't mean you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. It just means that you, you've you got the wrong side of these numbers right now. Now, Dr. Rizzi, you alluded to the early onset, the juvenile, the autoimmune uh, type, type, one, type. Type 1. So um, what are the other causes for uh, or risk factors for diabetes? Well, so again, type 1 is an autoimmune, and there really are no risk factors. That's the irony of this thing. You know, you can be lean and fit. You can be, you know, old, young, whatever. It, it, and nobody knows why in the world. Why does your pancreas, why does your body decide to start killing mm -hmm. these particular cells in your pancreas? It leaves everything else alone. Oh, they are predisposed to some other immune problems. So there aren't really any predisposing factors for that. You know, unless a family history. If both parents have type 1, there are certain statistics you have a greater chance. But you still have like a 95, 90% chance you won't. You know, but of course, it's not like 0.001. Type 2 is a different gonna, story. Are we ever going to be a point where you can cure type 1? Yes. Or are we just getting better at treating it? No, no. Well, no, well, I mean both. So it's, well, I guess not both because that's an either or. Sure. It's just. Yes. I know not just. Mean, yep. We are getting better in treating it. But there are a variety of, 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 of medicines and approaches that can stop this immune. The problem is, this immune destruction, the problem is that the treatments currently are, are relatively toxic. You know, and so that, yeah, you can give you, the, and they're literally the drugs you use for transplantation, but they're very toxic to take for a lifetime. But there's a lot of research going on understanding what, why are these, you know, cells attacking, and there are a lot of strategies coming up that don't involve toxic drugs that will stop that. So I think the answer is, will we ever? Yes. When? I don't think anyone knows that. But there is hope. So I interrupted your answer to Dr. Gakar's question. Well, the answer is, you know, for the other predisposing factors, is there anything that makes your body need more insulin? You know, so if, you, if you're overweight or obese, if you're sedentary, there are certain ethnic groups for some reason seem mm -hmm. to have a greater predisposition because mm -hmm. they probably have greater body fat, you know, for a given level, which may have been something very good for survival 10 years gone by. There are other factors, you know, that, you know, a history of gestational diabetes. There are other factors, and that these are the sort of the gestalt to go on. But it's primarily for most of us, it's, you know, overweight, sedentary, and if you happen to have the wrong ethnic background, you may have a greater for chance. But even then, if you stay lean, you don't get this disease. It's, it's, it's primarily a disease which is being driven by sedentary lifestyle and obesity. We've been talking about diabetes with Dr. Robert Rizzo. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk treatment options and prevention. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. We're back talking with diabetes expert Dr. Robert Rizzo. I'm sorry, I jumped in. I'm Tracy McCrae. And I'm Sanj Kaka. <laughs> During the commercial break, the two of you continued our conversation, and you said something, Dr. Rizzo, that I think we should uh, bring to our listeners. <laughs> what I was saying is that one of the conundrums about diabetes is why now? I mean, what's, mm -hmm. why is this happening? Mm -hmm. and I was just pointing out that in the 1920s, 1930s, you know, 30s, you know 100 years ago, the prevalence was, of diabetes was 2, 3, 4, 5 percent. It was, it was a rare disease. Now it's 25, 30, 40 percent, depending on how old you are. Our genes haven't changed in 100 years. Well, they have, but not much. What's happened is, is it's, it's the modern lifestyle. Is <clears> that <throat> so we all have this genetic predisposition? It's not one gene, but a polygenetic. And then all of a sudden, we do things to our bodies, you know, that make us need to create more insulin. And certain people cannot, you know. But that's why this disease was rare in the past, and it's not now. Not, not it's a disaster now. A disaster. In fact, the United States is relatively well off compared to. I'm referring to not getting this disease. Certain parts of the world that the prevalence is getting to the 50, 60 percent, you know, it's just a, yes. it's an epidemic. Wow. So you talk for the to same reasons, the same reasons, you know, because people are guess sedentary and gaining weight. Well, so the flip to that is you talked about the modern lifestyle. More and more people, I think, are working out than say they used to. So that would go against them getting diabetes. But yet, 
as you said, it's it's going up. So. But I, and actually, but you're right. Because remember, part of this is you look at the numbers for obesity. Because sure. you guys are more into this than I am. <laughs> you know, the numbers for obesity actually are leveling off, and that's very heartening. Yes. You know, you look around, and particularly the younger generation is beginning to. You see people are out walking, moving. You don't have to run. Right. You know anything, but running's good. You know, but also you can see this almost. It's almost as if people, you know, mothers, fathers said, "Not my kids." <laughs> yes. How. How is it that so many people uh, are undiagnosed? How does it go undiagnosed? Or how are people diagnosed? Let's start there. Yeah, well, the, as I said, the diagnosis is a fasting blood sugar 126, a hemoglobin A1C, et cetera, et cetera. So test. just a blood test. Yeah, a blood test. So the point is, if you don't give a blood test, you don't have any symptoms. You know, so if your blood sugar happens to be 126, you, 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 the idea of, of losing weight, of thirst, you know, and, you know, getting various infections, yeah, that's when your blood sugar is just sky high, 2, 300. You do not get that. You know, with blood sugars of 126, and yet the damage is already beginning. So you have to have a blood test. And that is why the American Diabetes Association and the other organizations, this is the easy thing, a blood test. And if you have an elevated blood sugar, then there are things you can do to stop it. But you got to know. So, but that's getting a blood test. What are the symptoms of diabetes? There are no symptoms until your blood sugars get sky high. Okay. You know, you, you urinate frequently, you get up and go to the bathroom just because your sugar is so high, it's spilling in the urine. Yes. But that's really high. Uh -huh. You know, that's how it used to be diagnosed. That's what diabetes mellitus means, you know, sweet urine. You know, but the thing is that by then, I mean, and you can have high blood sugars, but damage is being done. And again, not that if your sugars are high, if you treat it properly, as we'll get into a second, you can get this thing down. But for preventing this early on, you need to have a blood test. And also, but an eye exam can check can catch it too, right? Right. If and that's another important thing is because if you already have damage done, and, and the retina, you know, the ophthalmologist who see this, an optometrist you do dilated eye exams, but you want a dilated eye exam, can already see damage being done to the vessels. So of course that's the time to get you to the proper person, to your endocrinologist or somebody to help you take care of this. But you don't want to wait till you already have damage. I mean, but there, that is correct. You can see things. You can see kidneys, kidney problems if you have a kidney test. There are a variety of things, nerve problems, pain, numbness that can be coming up. But these are the things when you already have damage and you want to prevent that. You want to do something before that. You know, this, this hits very home to me because my father has, has non-insulin-dependent diabetes, yeah. diagnosed late in life, yeah. and was only diagnosed from a, an eye exam. Right. Had, otherwise had no symptoms, was right. very active. So hence the question. And, so, and that's a common problem is that people don't, they feel well, they feel fine. Yes. And, you, and that's, why you want to, that's why you want to know what your blood pressure is. You can't tell when your blood pressure is high, when you want to know what your cholesterol is. I mean, that, that's, that is what this is, that's why people are living longer. Living, you don't want to live longer, you want to live better. That's why they're living better because you can treat these things if you know, but you got to do the test. It, this is a, it's a curious, you've got a link there. Mm -hmm. I have a link with genetic uh, yeah. or with uh, gestational diabetes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that makes me pre-diabetic from the get-go just because I had gestational diabetes. Yeah. It, well, it's it, everywhere. It, it, it doesn't make you pre-diabetic. <laughs> what, what, what gestational diabetes means, when a woman is pregnant, during the second trimester, and particularly the third trimester, her body needs more insulin. It's, it's normal. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And so that is basically, you think of this as a stress test. So normally a woman's pancreas just secretes more insulin. But if you have this genetic predisposition, then you can't quite secrete more insulin. And so there's a little red flag saying, got to be careful here. And, but then again, if you remain lean and fit the rest of your life, you may never get diabetes. But it just puts you at a higher level. It just says it's a stress test when you were young that something wasn't working quite right. All right. We have about three minutes left. Let's talk about treatment options. Right. How have those changed, and what's new? Well, I mean, there are a variety of things that are new. It's been dramatic, which is happening. Is that again research? Because this is what this is all about: is gaining some insight as to why these insulin secreting cells are unable to create insulin. So there are certain certain drugs, so-called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide one. You know, we doctors make this stuff up, <laughs> but this is a hormone that your pancreas normally secretes. Your pancreas, your intestine normally secretes, and it tells the pancreas, "Hey, wake up! Here's some food. Secrete insulin." Problem is, it only lasts for two minutes. Mm -hmm. so, so companies have made either enzymes that inhibit the degradation, so-called DP4 antagonists, or GLP agonists, which are these things that can last for days or even weeks. And these have been dramatic. These, these are quite effective. You know, they have their issues, and they're all pros and cons. They're drugs that basically make the kidney pee glucose out. Who would ever have thought that you could mm -hmm. lower your blood sugar by peeing glucose out? But, it, but they work. But they, they, they seem to have unexpected but positive effects on the heart and kidneys. There are other drugs that are very, very good at making the insulin work better in such dynamics that didn't work before, like getting into the technical details of letting your doctor, she can give the insulin to you or teach you in a manner much better off for your body. But I also understand you can have the non-insulin-dependent type 
and then go into insulin dependence. We refer like to a type two, type two, type two sorry, not, not type, insulin dependent. Type, right. type two into type one. Well, all it is is that is the uh, it is not it, it's type one. It's, what it all boils down to the evolution of type two is your pancreas is progressively losing insulin secretion. That's why you get it when you're 50 instead of when you're 30. I see. But you could be in your 60s and your pancreas kept losing secretion in your 80s and 90s. Now you're not secre you're still secreting some, but not much. And this gets into a, you know, sort of a semantic issue about what do you have at that point in time. Uh, speaking of semantics, can diabetes be reversed? Well, it, That's it, probably not the right word to use. No, it, it can. I mean, it's the definition of diabetes is a fasting 126. Sure. You can get your get blood sugar low. at 125. Sure. And that actually is really a, a philosophical question is that you now have diabetes. So, for example, by losing weight, you know, bariatric surgery, which is a whole bunch of issues with it, but mm -hmm. it's very helpful for some people, you know, that we refer to the word as remission, we being the medical profession. So there are people who have been on insulin, come off insulin, don't need pills, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, commonly as the years go on, their blood sugars will go back up because they can't screen enough insulin. But what you've done is you've, you've turned the clock back. You know, so there's a whole variety of ways that indeed you can turn this clock back and effectively reverse the disease. Well, you can turn the clock back, but you're not going to reverse the damage if to your eyes or to your... If you kept your blood sugars normal since you were diagnosed... There is evidence from the so-called diabetes control and complications trial. This was done in, you know, the early 1990s. This was the original randomized study showing if you treat diabetes, it's beneficial. Those people who participated in those trials who kept their blood sugar normal, their chances of dying now are no different than a non-diabetic person. But they were treated early on for a long time. That's the crux of this is early and effectively. We've been talking about diabetes during Diabetes Awareness Month. Hold on. We've still got another. Oh. Got look. We still have, we go till eighteen. Oh, I thought seven. Okay. No, I'm All messing right, with you. Okay. Uh, so tell us about prevention of diabetes. What uh, what is it that you want people to know during Diabetes Awareness Month? This is prevention of type two. I want people to know during Diabetes Awareness Month period is take care of yourself. Whether you have type one or type two, work with your healthcare provider. You know, whoever she or he may well be, because again, this is a team. This is the classic thing. But preventing it is literally stay lean and stay fit. Eat well. You know, and, and there are all kinds of crazy diets. Of course, as you can I mean, like most things you realize, if, it, if it's crazy, you know it doesn't make sense. It's crazy. You know, the one thing that makes sense is the so-called Mediterranean diet. Repeatedly has been shown, you know, which is basically high complex carbohydrate, low saturated fat, you know, high monounsaturated fat, small amounts of protein, you know, reducing free sugars. It's what, you know, probably what your mother and father, we all were told we're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. That is the diet, best diet. And calories, of course. You can eat the best food in the world, if you eat too much of it, you'll gain weight. But eat the right amount of the right kinds of food. We and, and what do you see for the future? What do you think is I going mean, to... the future is trying to understand what makes these insulin screening cells die. And there's a lot of research, including here at Mayo, understanding that. If you knew how to keep cells from dying, and even more remarkably, people who have type 1, 40, 50 years, are still making insulin screening cells. They're dying. So if you could stop them, basically whatever is killing them, then they could grow their own insulin screening cells back. In addition to regenerative medicine, stem cells, all the exciting things trying to put other insulin cells in. But I think that's where the science is going to be going, is how do you make them live? How do you make them, if you can't do that, how do you make new ones? You know, and then how do you make them work better? And how do you make the insulin work better, so-called insulin resistance? Sure. We've been talking about diabetes during Diabetes Awareness Month with Mayo Clinic endocrinologist Dr. Robert Rizza. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Rizza. Thank you.